It happened as the bell rang, finally signaling a long-awaited recess. But as we got to our feet, another message played over the speaker system. Students of Recall Hall, please remain seated. The school has been put on lockdown. No one is allowed to leave under any circumstances. We all groaned in annoyance, hardly a soul taking the message seriously. Whatever drill we assumed the school was putting us through, none of us were having it. Only then did I glance outside to see three armored military vehicles approaching the school at high speeds. Within a minute, dozens of soldiers poured out with heavy equipment and metal plates running up to our windows. One by one, they started boarding them up, drilling the plates in front of our windows, making any thought of escape impossible. What's happening? Leo asked from the back of the class. The teacher didn't answer. He looked just as confused as the rest of us. He went to his desk and pulled out a phone, calling the principal, but he didn't answer. We're just going to stay here, all right? Let them deal with the situation, then we can leave. I dug my mobile phone out from my bag, only to find that I didn't have any signal. While the school always had crappy service, I'd never been left without the possibility to call out. Whatever the soldiers had done, it had blocked off our only means of contacting the outside world. I can't call anyone, I said, holding up my phone. The other students, even Mr. Morgans, pulled out their phones, each of them with the same result. Everybody keep calm, it'll be all right, Mr. Morgan said unconvincingly. We just need to wait here for them to help. His words were interrupted by frantic screaming coming from the hallway and heavy footsteps running just outside the door. We all sat in silence, listening intently to the commotion going on outside. Then, one by one, the screams were silenced, replaced by distant gurgles. By then, some of my classmates had started crying, while others sat frozen in fear. Fuck this shit, I'm leaving, one of the students said. It was Jack, the class has had. He'd always been a daredevil, claiming nothing could scare him, but even for him, this was ridiculous beyond belief. He ran for the door, pulled it open, and started running down the hall. Mr. Morgans was too slow to stop him. He just rushed over to pull the door closed. We all sat back, ready for another bout of screams, but they never came. By all means, it seemed like Jack had made it to safety, but how he'd possibly leave the school, we didn't know. He made it? Leo called from the back. I don't know, it sounds like he's fine. Another one chimed in. As the news of his escape hit us, more of the students started feeling confident we could get out with him. Whatever the military had blocked the school for, it wasn't to keep us safe, so staying in one place might end up getting us all killed. While Mr. Morgans demanded we stay back, he couldn't fight us all, so a group consisting of four students, including myself, decided to leave. Leo took the lead, sticking his head outside the door and signaling that it was all clear. We ducked into the hallway in silence, making sure it was empty. The place was eerily quiet, a stark contrast to both its usual self and the screaming we'd heard moments earlier. We unanimously decided to head in the opposite direction of the sound, which also went towards the main exit. While we all figured the main exit was blocked, we were hoping one of the ventilation shafts had been forgotten, and the only vent entrance we knew about was situated near the main doors. If Jack had made it outside, that would be the only way. As we walked down the hall, the lights suddenly went out. It appeared that the electricity had been cut because even the ventilation system fell silent, meaning the whole building had lost power. The only light we had then came from our mobile phones, but it hardly provided any comfort. Then I slipped and hit my head on the ground. It hurt, and as I went to rub the back of my head, it felt wet. At first, I was worried I might have cracked my head open, but then I realized that my entire back was wet. Leo shined his flashlight at my back, immediately gasped as he realized I was covered in blood. The only issue was, it didn't belong to me. The entire hallway was covered in blood, the floor, the walls, and the ceiling. Maybe we should turn back? Lee said. No, we need to get out, Tyler argued back. We kept going, slowly moving forward in silence until we finally saw the exit. As suspected, the doors had been sealed shut by the same metal plates, but next to the door stood a ladder leading up to the vent, probably the one Jack had used to escape. 
Tyler rushed to the front and started ascending the ladder. As he got to the vent, he froze in place. Jack? He said quietly. He's in there? I asked. Yeah. But he's not moving. Then Tyler started tugging on Jack's legs and tumbled back as he pulled half his body out of the vent, falling onto the ground and knocking himself out for a moment. Jack was dead, which meant that the monster had either climbed inside the vents or there were several of them. We, we should go back to the classroom and wait for help, Elise suggested as she stared at what was left of Jack. None of us could disagree, so we got Tyler back on his feet and started quietly walking back, praying not to garner the attention of whatever monstrosity had been unleashed within our school. When we finally got back, we found the door to our classroom broken and smashed to pieces. We stood frozen outside until I finally got the guts to check inside, holding the other back to protect them from what I knew was coming. The entire room was smeared with blood, with chunks of flesh lying on the floor. Every single person in the classroom had been killed, torn to shreds by an unknown entity. Had we not left to look for a way out, we'd all be dead too. What, what are we going to do? Elise asked. I don't know. We just have to keep looking for a way out. We can't stay here. We turned to walk in the opposite direction, hoping to find shelter, or maybe even an escape through the basement. But as we turned to run, we heard a bizarre sound shatter the silence around us. What was that? Tyler asked with a shaky voice. It was the thing. It has to be. The darkness felt more overwhelming than ever, but we had to keep going. We ran through the halls, occasionally coming across streaks of blood. As we turned a corner, we heard Elise scream for her life. No, help me! She'd been snatched by a mangled appendage that wrapped itself around her leg. It stretched endlessly far into the darkness, belonging to a being that was too far away to see. We tried to grab onto her, but she was slipping away too fast. We could hear the bone within her leg get crushed to pieces as she slipped away from our grasp. Elise! Tyler yelled as he started to run after her. Leo tried to follow, but I pulled him back. Don't do it. We can't help her. Tyler! Leo yelled, hoping to bring him back to us. It was too late. He too got entangled in the many dark appendages, his body being crushed almost instantly under the pressure. They were dead, and there was nothing me and Leo could do about it. So we kept running, turning around corners blindly in an aimless attempt at escape. We'd gotten lost in the vast hallways of the school, and there were no obvious ways out. At least, we came to another set of doors that led out into freedom, but they were locked. Defeated, I just collapsed onto the ground, but Leo wasn't ready to give up. He kept hammering on the boarded up windows, and in the distance, we could hear the monster come closer. Within minutes, he'd be dead. Then, as he hammered for the last time, the metal panel suddenly vanished, letting light in for the first time. The doors blew open, and a team of heavily armed soldiers came running into the building. They threw something I could only describe as military-grade Molotovs before one of them turned to us. Is there anyone else left? No, no, they, they're all dead, I stuttered. With that, they pulled us out and sealed the doors back up. That was pretty much it. They loaded us into a vehicle and drove us to an isolated field hospital set up inside some warehouse. Once they'd confirmed we didn't carry any strange infections, we were put through a series of interviews. But nothing came of it, because the school was gone the next day, burned to the ground, and removed as if it never existed. And the hundreds of deaths were claimed to be caused by a crazy fire. All of it got brushed under the rug. But I can't hide the truth anymore. Even if they kill me, I need to get this story out. People deserve to know. Hey, you. Would you like to get access to four exclusive bonus stories every month? Of course you would. So check out my Patreon page at patreon.com slash drnosleep. Just look at what my current patrons have said about the bonus stories. These are just a few of the comments they left. So if you want access to these exclusive stories too, be sure to sign up at patreon.com slash drnosleep. You can find the link in the video description. And now back to the story. This will be my last transmission. If you're hearing this, 
Please know that I did my best to save you all. I've run out of food, and there's just no cure to this plague. When I die, my body will be located at... Please burn the place to the ground and pour concrete atop of the remains. There's no solution. Please, do not open the door. I'm so sorry for what we have created, but as long as I die inside this building, it means you all get to live. In the beginning of 2012, I joined a group called Sano Project, a bunch of scientists funded by an unknown prospector. Our goal was simple in concept only, to produce a vaccine that would immunize people via aerosol droplets. We'd been given a heap of different substances and pathogens to achieve the desired effect. We'd be using mice for the experiment, but due to the high risk of accidental contagion, we were put into lockdown for the duration of the experiment, which was only supposed to last six months. Food and supplies would be delivered using an isolated lift, taking everything we needed underground into an airlock. When we started, there were six of us, with Professor Jenkins in the lead. He was an old and equally odd fellow, but he was the top in his field. There was no one more suited for the job, and the five of us that worked under him greatly admired the man. Still, outside of work hours, he confined himself to his room with lab reports and an endless pile of books about exotic infectology. Honestly, as much as I enjoyed working under such a great mind, he scared me at times. He seemed overly enthusiastic about the experiment part and less so about saving lives. For the first five months, work went on as normal. We combined different pathogens and tried to create harmless fragments from their protein capsule, aerosolizing them as a vaccine, hoping the mice's bodies would absorb them. It was an endless stream of disappointment as the poor animals kept dying. Then, at the end of the six month contract, Professor Jenkins created something new entirely. While it wasn't anything near what we wished, he'd managed to invent something no one thought possible. He'd mixed a strain of highly infectious virus with a bacteria. It was a miracle with limitless harmful potential, and it terrified us. Still, his explanation somewhat lulled half the staff into a false sense of security. His idea was that the right mix of pathogens, he could invent a virus that integrated itself into the human genome which then started producing a new type of defense mechanism entirely, something separate to the immune system. To us, it sounded like a ludicrous fever dream, but the higher ups were convinced by his ramble, basically forcing us to stay under lockdown for another six months as we worked on Professor Jenkins' new personal pet project. We followed orders, making countless hybrid pathogens, all in the hopes that it might lead to a cure for all infections. I repeatedly voiced my concerns, but the rest were too afraid of reprisals to take my side. Then, halfway into the second term, the professor called me into his office. He looked unbelievably tired, as if he'd been awake for days. I hadn't seen him much lately, as he'd always confined himself to his office while he did grunt work. I've finally done it, Carl, he said ecstatically. A vaccine? But we haven't even started the aerosolized trials yet? I asked, confused. He chuckled. <laughs> We won't need trials, not for this. What are you talking about? I thought you would get it, Carl. Have you even looked around the world lately? We create cures for everything from basic infections to cancer and genetic mutations. We keep people alive decades past their supposed lifespan. And for what? To finally destroy the planet? To let our sheer numbers be the inevitable downfall of mankind? He went to the door, locking it before removing the key. I felt adrenaline surge through my body, and though I knew something horrible would come next, I hadn't the faintest clue what. I've created something that will save us all, but I need someone to start it all, someone younger, healthier than myself. With that, he plunged a syringe into my neck before I could react. I pulled it out as fast as I could, but whatever its contents, it had been injected into my bloodstream. What the hell, I started to say before the world went black before me. As I was left unconscious, I couldn't tell whether I had died or if I was just sleeping. It all felt so quiet around me, but also warm. It was an odd sensation, almost as if pressure was building up within me, getting ready to explode. Then, as if no time had passed at all, I awoke once more, lying on the cold floor of Professor Jenkins' floor. 
He was sitting behind his desk with labored breathing. Ah, you're finally awake. That means it has finally begun. He struggled to get out between breaths. I sat myself up and looked over at the professor. His skin looked oddly red, with flakes forming from ruptured blisters all over his body. What did you do? I gave you the cure. The only thing that can destroy humanity. My creation. It'll save this planet from us. His head started sinking as more blisters formed on his body. On his arm, chunks of flesh had rotted straight off. He was infected with something. The same thing he'd given me. Don't worry, Carl. You're the only one that can withstand this disease. That's why you're special. Because you'll be the one that is remembered as patient zero. He passed out on his desk, barely breathing. Then I heard knocks on the door as the rest of the crew were starting to get concerned. No, wait! I tried to yell, but it was too late. They'd already barged in. What the hell happened to the professor? One of them asked as they went to check on him. It was too late. They'd already breathed the same air as us, which meant they would be dead in a couple of hours at most. Only a minute after they touched him, the first crewman started coughing violently, then the second, third, and before the hour had passed, they were all dying. They called for help. No one came, because they didn't want to release the contagion. I was the only healthy one, which led the administration to believe that there might be a cure in my blood. They demanded blood samples be taken from me, but as the crew fell unconscious, I had to make a decision. If I let any sample escape this lab, the pathogen would be out there. So I did the only right thing. I disabled the only entrance into the lab, putting myself into eternal lockdown. What are you doing, Carl? One of the security guards said over the loudspeakers. We're sending in a hazmat team to save your sorry ass. Open the damn door. I can't. You'll get infected, he said. No, I won't. I'm not going to die from this, but everyone that gets near me will. If I open this door, I'll start the spread to the outside world. There's no other way. But then I heard him cough through the radio, <coughs> which is when it hit me that the professor had opened up the vents, allowing the toxic air within to mix with theirs. What the hell is happening to me? The security guard said over the radio. He was dead, just like everyone else within the building. Listen, you need to seal down the building. No, I, I can't. If you don't do it now, everyone is going to die. He left the radio, and I could only pray that we weren't too late. Even the hazmat team was coughing their lungs out. They'd been infected before they even came down here. The only one immune was myself, because I was the ultimate carrier. I locked it down. I, I... The security guard said over the radio with his last breath. Everyone died shortly after that. With the building on permanent lockdown, I was alone. That was seven months ago. Since then, I've been working on finding a cure for myself, but I'm just not smart enough. Supplies have run out, and as I'm typing this, my vision has gone blurry with hunger and thirst. I'm going to die soon, but as long as the contagion remains within this building, it will have been worth it. We were just chilling in front of the television, idly watching the colorful images without thinking too much about its actual content. That had always been our usual routine, to get home, not speak, and just turn our brains off for the evening. But on that night in particular, all of our phones went off within 15 seconds of each other. We all jumped to attention in confusion, checking our phones simultaneously. All it had been was a simple message, but one carrying a crystal clear meaning. Emergency alert. This is a message to the citizens of Newport. Do not leave your homes. Stay inside and don't open the door to anyone, not even your own family or friends. This is not a test. Stay inside, turn off the lights. Our minds raced, but none of us were able to speak a single word. I looked over at my dad, who'd put on his glasses to make sure he read the message correctly. My mother seemed worried. Her eyes filled to the brim with panic. What is this? My dad finally asked. While the message was clear, it didn't really explain the situation. It was the first and only emergency alert we'd ever received in our small town. 
apart from the occasional test message. It was real. Something dangerous was on its way, and we hadn't the faintest idea what. I went over to the window, only to see each and every one of our neighbors begin to turn the lights off. Within a couple of minutes, the entire neighborhood had turned dark, leaving us confused in a haze of ignorance. I'm calling the police, Dad said as he dialed the number. It started to ring, and Dad put the phone on speaker. But instead of a person picking up, he just received an automated message. We're experiencing heavy call volumes at this time. Please do not hang up. You will be redirected to one of our dispatchers shortly. What is going on? Mom asked. I don't know. This is... Dad said before trailing off. I still stood by the window, watching the empty neighborhood, wondering if anyone would defy the message and go outside. In the meantime, Dad was trying to call the police again. After the third attempt, he tried to reach his co-worker instead, who lived further downtown. Hey, David, did you get the same message as us? Dad asked. Yeah, it's bizarre. Most people are staying inside, though. A few went out on the street to mess around, those idiots. They seem fine, but I don't know. Wait, what's that? Dad waited patiently as David went silent on the other end of the line. I think the military is out on the street, but they look odd. They're all wearing gas masks, but they have three eyes. I don't even know what kind of weapons they're carrying. Can you take a picture and send it to us? I'll try, hold on. A few seconds passed and another beep could be heard from my dad's phone, signifying that we'd received a picture. My dad quickly opened it, but what greeted us was little more than a tangled mess of colors from a clearly corrupt photograph. David, the picture isn't showing up, try again. Yeah, it doesn't work. The camera won't save the pictures correctly. A loud screech took over the line, shoving us all to the ground as we held our hands tightly over our ears. Though it came from the phone, it was an impossible sound that should have blown the speakers to smithereens in a second. Once the sound had subsided, we could still hear someone frantically breathing on the other end. David, what happened? They, they ki killed them all. They shot them with these weapons, just shredded them to pieces. All that, that's is, is, he stuttered. David, you need to hide, dad yelled. But they're, they're just standing there. It's like they're frozen in place. I don't understand. Why are they doing this? Why are they? His words froze in his throat. Oh my God, they saw me. They're coming towards me, they're. Then the line fell dead. Dad tried to call David back, but no one responded. Our house fell dead silent, only interrupted by the intermittent beeps produced by the calling phone. My mom wandered nervously around the house, and I just stared at the window, paranoid that something might break through the door. He's gone. David, pick up the damn phone, Dad mumbled to himself. That's when I saw them, walking down the street. They weren't moving normally, and their steps were too quick, each movement snapping into place. They were wearing strange uniforms that might have looked like military uniforms in the dark. But once they got closer, it was clear they weren't even human. One of the neighbor's doors shut open, and the Johnsons came running towards the military, thinking they were finally safe. But no sooner had they been spotted by the marching creatures before they lifted their weapons. The same screech filled the neighborhood, almost knocking me to the ground as the air literally started to vibrate. The family screamed in agony for a moment, but within seconds, their bodies just started disintegrating until all that was left was a pile of flesh that resembled minced meat. I wanted to scream, but before I got the chance, my dad put his hand over my mouth. Do you want to die? Keep your mouth shut, he whispered. Just that mere sound briefly turned the creature's attention in our direction. But once we fell silent, they just stopped. There they stood, as if frozen in time. For minutes, all we could do was stare at them in shock. Then, one of the neighbor's automatic lights turned on, triggered by the cat returning home. The same second, 
The creatures all turned to the house, raising their weapons and firing. As the loud sound rang through the house, my dad grabbed me and my mom. We were taking the opportunity to flee to the basement, where we prayed we might be safe at least for a while. We never even saw what happened to the neighbor's house. We just heard the screams of agony as they all fell to pieces. Now we're just hiding down here, without food, without water. We've tried to call for help, but no one is picking up. Whether it's because they're dead or hiding, we don't know. So I'm sending this, a hopeless call for help. If anyone out there receives this, please save us. We don't have much time left. Thanks for watching, and don't forget to check out the Dr. No Sleep podcast available on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and many more. There you will find a plethora of bone-chilling horror stories to listen to. Also, be sure to subscribe and turn notifications on to stay tuned for new videos.